Alright, I'm back with another New Scott interview, and today I'm here with Maritime Wrestling's uh, Steve Arsenal, formerly known as Double XL. How are you doing today? Good, man. How are you doing? I'm doing good. good. Uh, before we get started here, why why the name Double XL? Where did that come from? Um, that actually, uh, it started kind of, uh, when I first started out, I was, uh, I was, not that I'm the biggest guy now, but I was a lot smaller in stature. And, uh, like, when I started, I was wrestling with guys like Chris Cook. I was on the same roster as Brody Steele and Mike Hughes and these guys that are just massive in stature. And uh, I was trying to come up with different names, and I remember it was, like, the day of the first show that we were doing, and it was, like, down to these two names, and Double XL was one of them. And uh, the reason was, in my head, I, I was working heel, too, so in my head it was, like... Uh, you know, the crowd, if they never saw me before, would hear, you know, double XL on the way to the ring and think this big, massive, you know, jacked up dude. And uh, and then little skinny me would come out as a heel. And it was like, you know, like the fat guy being named tiny or slim or something like that. So it was more like an ironic heel thing. And uh, I guess I really didn't look further down the line that, you know, now I'm going to be stuck with this double XL name, even if my gimmick changes, which it did, and, you know, the name change kind of came with it. All right. Uh, were you a fan of professional wrestling growing up? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, uh, like some kids are into, like, hockey or, you know, people are into football and stuff like that. Wrestling was, like, the thing that I was into, you know, from the time, you know, that I can remember watching TV. One of my earliest memories is that old square WWF logo with the red sky in the background. Um, my grandmother was a huge wrestling fan, um, like literally, like in every every um, way that you could be a wrestling fan. Like hated all the bad guys, loved all the good guys. If someone turned from good to bad, she could have been liking this. This could have been her favorite wrestler the week before, but you know she'd be like, ah, "That Bret Hart, I I used to like how he was, but." I don't like what he's up to these days, so, you know, she was a fan through and through, um, and, uh, yeah, I just grew up watching wrestling with my nanny. She watched it, all, like, all the way right till like, the day she died, basically. Who was your favorite wrestler? Um, I was a huge Bret Hart fan, um, and a closet Shawn Michaels fan, um, but, you know, now getting, you know, to do what I do, um, I really respect a lot of the stuff that Shawn Michaels did, and, uh, I, uh, you know, my style was more similar to, to his, but growing up, you know, I was, you know, just like my nanny, the perfect wrestling fan. If they were bad, I hated them, and if they were good, I loved them. Um, Hulk Hogan, of course, was I was a huge fan of Hogan. I think somewhere in, my, in one of these boxes over here, I actually have a picture of me with the old school red and yellow Hogan bandana <laughs> awesome. and the foam WWF belt doing the, the Hulkster pose with no muscles. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then Brett, uh, Steve Austin, I was a huge Steve Austin fan, of course, like, uh, I was coming through high school when the whole Attitude Era thing was going on, and, uh, it was around that time that I kind of, like, started liking the bad guys a little bit more than the good guys, so, like, uh, like, the Outsiders, when they did the thing, um, in WCW, yeah, the Too Sweet, obviously, I throw that up all the time, and that's where that comes from, I was a, I was an NWO mark, I was a mark when Hogan turned heel, um, and I was a Triple H fan, believe it or not, uh, at one point, when, and I think that was like during his rise up. I think I was always a fan of that, that guy that was the Intercontinental Champion and then started getting that push to the heavyweight title, the guy that's never won the title. I think, even to this day, I think uh, uh, fans look for that, uh, the Zack Ryder thing, when he just won the, the IC belt there at WrestleMania. I think that was that same emotion, this guy that's never got that push finally gets that spot. And the fans, man, they're loyal. They will follow wrestling and follow storylines and follow characters. And I think, you know, it, just like a movie, you want to see that hero's rise, right? And, uh, yeah, uh, I was a fan of all those guys. Uh, how did you get involved in maritime wrestling? Um, okay, so, uh, like I said, I was a huge wrestling fan growing up. Um, I played hockey uh, from the time that I was, like, six years old to the time I was 16 years old. And, like, competitive hockey. Um, and that was like my big athletic thing. I would train for it. I'd play uh, hockey pretty much every single weekend, uh, twice through the week, plus practices almost every single day. Um, so I was, I was athletic. Um, my hockey thing just ended, and I, there was like two years where I did nothing. 
And I, from, you know, being active from the time I was six years old to the time I was 16 years old, these two years where I did nothing, like, it drove me crazy. Like, I didn't know what to do with myself. And I was 18, and I lived in Churro, and there was an advertisement in the paper, or it wasn't even an advertisement in the paper, uh, Frank Parker, who a lot of people know here locally, uh, he's, he's ref for years, he's toured with Grand Prix refing and, and ref several other shows. He recently passed away, uh, God rest his soul, he was a great guy. Um, but at the time, he wrote an article in the Truro Daily News, like weekly. And sometimes it would just, he would critique Raw that night, or like when the WCW, uh, WWE Monday Night Wars were going on, he would talk about both sides. And he was quite smart about it. And my grandmother was actually the one that used to read the article, and, and she let me know, hey, there's like this wrestling article. So then I started reading it. And uh, one day there was, a, he wrote an article about a, a local promotion called River City Wrestling. Wrestling. Uh, uh, I have one of their t-shirts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not too many people know about them, but I mean, there are some guys that, uh, like, Sexton Phoenix came through there, um, Chris Cook came through there, um, Shane Stevens came through there, um, but uh, it was basically Frank saying he had went to a show in Economy, Nova Scotia, which is, like, literally like a gas station on a road, and I guess people live around the gas station somehow and survive. <laughs> But it's, it's way in the middle of nowhere, um, and they had done a show, and Frank Parker had wrote, kind of putting them over and saying, you know, any local person that wants to get into wrestling should contact one of these two guys. Mm -hmm. So I contact, well, it was weird how I got Frank Parker's info, too. I ended up actually calling Truro Daily News, asking for Frank Parker's contact info. Like, this was way before, like, internet was big. Um, and they gave me his home phone number, believe it or not. So I call him, they leave a message, I say who I am, I say what I'm looking to do. And, uh, and Frank calls me back like the next day. And I ended up going up to his house and I met him. Um, and he goes, all right, I'll uh, contact these two guys and, and see if I can get you a tryout. So he contacts uh, Jason Murphy, who was the promoter there. Um, he did some work around here too, is Jason Holiday. I don't know if anyone remembers that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, he contacted him. And then um, it was me and my uh, my buddy of mine, Charlie Frazier, and he was a big dude. And, they, and Jason Murphy's like, okay, you guys put together a trio batch. And I'm thinking, how the hell do I put the, where, in my yard? Like, I don't have a ring. Like, how am I supposed to put together a trio batch? And uh, so what, what we did, uh, and this is how green I was to the business at the time and, and how much I didn't know, we went to the local boxing club in Churro. Because I'm like, oh, that's a ring. That's, that's a stiff ring. <laughs> that's got to be the same. And lo and behold, it is not the same. Um, boxing rings are meant to keep two fighters in an enclosed area. That's not meant to fall down on. In a boxing match, maybe someone will fall down once. It's not built to repeatedly throw yourself down on. And we did. And I remember leaving, like, if Frank would come down sometimes, sometimes he wouldn't, like, like, he would critique stuff, and he was like, dude, I'm a referee, I can't tell you too, too much, but I can tell you if something looks good or if it doesn't look good. And he did, and he gave us a lot of his free time to, uh, to help us out, and I remember me and Charlie leaving that boxing club, like, crippled, like, doing the whole, you wake up the next day, you go to sit up, you can't get up, so you gotta roll go to bed to your knees, and then walk yourself up with your hands, like, it was brutal. And uh, we sent the tape in, and, and like I said, the, the Charlie guy I was doing it with, he was a big dude. And I was just, I was small, like 150 pounds probably, and I'm like, they're going to take they're gonna take this tape, and they're going to take Charlie, and, and that's going to be it for me. So we get the tape, and it's like the day that we're supposed to show up and give them the tape, they're running a show. And uh, we get there, and, uh, and I thought everything was discussed, like, kind of third party with this Jason guy. And I thought, you know, we'd get there, and he would know exactly who we were, and that we were bringing him this tape. Like, he didn't know who we were <laughs> about this tape or anything. And I remember he was signing autographs in intermission. I walk up, and I introduce myself. And again, so green that I, I don't even think I shook his hand. I just said, hey, man, I'm Steve, and uh, I was told to come talk to you about being a wrestler. And... And literally, there's a little kid, and he signed the autograph, and he looks up, and like literally doesn't even look at me, and he says, and he goes, you're too small to be a wrestler. And he signed the thing, and he got up, and he walked away, and I was like, I stood there literally like dumbfounded, like I didn't know what to do, I didn't know how to react to it. And I went back, and I sat down, and I started, it started pissing me off, right? So I'm like, all the stuff was supposed to be talked about, and he looked at me for two seconds and said, you're too small, and that was it. 
Um, so fucking, uh, so yeah, so I left that night and I contacted Frank and he was like, oh, we were supposed to talk to this Tory Finney guy who was kind of like Holiday's partner. That's, who, I guess, who Frank talked to. So we ended up getting the tape to him and uh, Jason Holiday ended up uh, getting back to me as it was, uh, your buddy needs some work, but we're willing to, uh, willing to give you a shot. And that's how it started. All right, my next question is generally who trained you? But uh, I'm, I'm going to phrase yours a bit differently. I'm, sure. I'm looking at a picture here on my phone. Oh, God. <laughs> and it says, one of Maritime Wrestling's most popular superstars, professional wrestler for over 14 years, trained by Canadian legend Wildman Gary Williams. Okay, 14 years ago would bring us back to 2002. Yeah. Gary was on tour with Real Action Wrestling. Yeah. Gary didn't actually start training people until October of 2005. Yeah. Uh, so what's up with that? So how did that work? <laughs> yeah. okay. So we were uh, we were outlaws for a little bit. Um, the whole group, that whole River City Wrestling group that I started with, I don't think anyone was trained. Um, it, it was a bunch of guys. They started out doing this in their backyard with a really makeshift ring, and then they put together a little bit more of a, a professional type ring, and then they'd start running out rec centers and legions. And that's when I started. Uh, it was the first show of the new ring in the new rec center. And um, and then we wrestled there for a little bit, and then when River City Wrestling stopped, when they when Jason Holiday I think he moved to Japan or something like that, and uh, we ended up buying the ring, me and Chris Cook and Brian McKay, uh, not Spider Man, true Brian McKay, and then we started. I, that confused me forever. I didn't realize there was two guys with the same yeah, name. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we used to call it our Brian and Spider Man. Yeah. Um, so we bought the ring, and then we started uh, New Breed Wrestling. Um, and we started running shows there. And, and again, at this time, um, Chris Cook had went down, and that's where he met Gary, and he met Pete. And what year was this? Like, uh, this would have been maybe 2006, 2007. With, when Cook went to Gary's school? When Cook, when okay. Cook, yeah, yeah, when okay. Cook went down. Right. So Cook went down, uh, Sexton Phoenix went down, um, and then they started making connections. And then that's when I came down, and that's when Gary finalized my training. By that point, I had already been wrestling for two or three years. But there was a lot that I did wrong. Um, so I used to kind of tag along on those Chris classes here and there. And then I got to know Gary and work with him more. And, and Gary gave me the polish and let me know a lot of the stupid things I was doing wrong. And showed me a lot of little tricks to get more out of what I could do. Because athletically I could do a lot of stuff. But the, the when and whys to do it were never really there. And that's where Gary really helped me out. Uh, what was the hardest thing for you to catch on to? when from going from doing it untrained to doing it uh, properly when Gary... I remember um, me and Josh uh, did a match, um, J Riddick Stone, and I think it was our only singles match that we've ever done actually, and uh, we were coming from New Breed to UCW, and uh, you know, we on the drive up we're putting together like all of this crazy shit because athletically we could do it. He was really strong and I could do some agile stuff. So we're like, let's do everything. And, uh, which is totally wrong. If you have three big things, you know, that you can athletically do, you should be building to those and getting, you know, so much more out of those three single things. But we went out there and tried to do everything. And I remember Cowboy Mike Hughes was literally waiting through the curtain when we both walked through and it was like, he was he was right on everything that he said, but I remember at the time it was like uh, you know when you mess up and your dad's like sit down we gotta talk <laughs> you know and and he nails you with all this logic that's a hundred percent right and you realize fuck you know we fucked up a little bit so I think it was just toning it back uh, and getting more out of you know what I could do that that was my biggest thing you know and I think like to think now as I got older I kind of gotten that down a little bit better. But that was the big transition of not going out there and, and trying to give them everything all at once. Uh, so you went from New Breed Wrestling to UCW, Ultimate Championship Wrestling, is that yeah. right? Yeah. What, what year did you start with UCW? I think that was 2007 or 2008. What are some of your memories of working for Ultimate Championship Wrestling? Um, I remember I literally um, almost had to like... like I don't want to say beg for bookings, but I was very persistent trying to get bookings there. And I remember... I'd be on a show here and there, and then I wouldn't be on like three shows, and I'd be like, what the hell? Um, and, and I was very persistent in trying to get in, and I knew that um, I would only be able to go so far wrestling in the Truro area, 
and I knew to expand and get more contacts and stuff like that, I had to be there. So, you know, for any uh, uh, young workers in this area that are trying to get in, get their foot in the door, like I would go to shows and help. Like back then, I would go to go to their shows, help set up, hoping that somewhere during the day, and you can't just go, you know, ten minutes before the show and, and hope they throw you in. Like everything's going to be done and figured out by then. You go there through the day, you make yourself known, you, you know, say right off the bat, hey man, look, I'm here, I'm going to help set up, I'll help tear down. If anything opens up or anyone doesn't show up or any spot becomes available, I got my gear in the car. And then you shut the fuck up about it and you go help. And that's what I would do. And, and I think just being persistent and staying on it, finally you started using me. And then, you know, and, and then, you know, same to anyone else. If they start using it, they give you a chance, man, you better... Do something with that chance and i started getting over as a heel there and then all of a sudden boom they started putting me in there regularly and yeah when you started with ucw uh cowboy mike hughes and brody Steele were both yep. on the roster uh they left mm -hmm. uh what were your thoughts uh on them leaving i was so green at the time that that uh, i don't think that um like, I don't even think I was inside the inner circle of the guys at that point. So, you know, if they left, I didn't know why they left or anything like that or, or what that actually meant to the promotion as a whole. Um, at the time, I was just trying to get booked. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was, you know, I didn't even know anyone. I, at that point, when I first started IHW, I didn't even know any of the, the IHW crew or that IHW was a thing. Actually, I did know it was a thing. And it was this really awesome promotion in Moncton. That's all I knew about it. And we were all, at the time, like... Even Chris Cook, I think Chris Cook and Saxon Phoenix went up and did a couple one shots with them or something, and um, and they came back and they were like, "Dude, that's we got to get up there. Like that's that's the place to be." But I, at this point, I didn't know anything about them other than that. A couple of years into UCW, uh, you did a show with Bret Hart and uh, Chavo Guerrero. Yeah. Uh, what are your memories of that show? Um, that was awesome. I think it was a tour, and uh, at that point. <coughs> I had kind of, uh, I had went from like this kind of, and, and too, personally, I was starting to look at things and I was like, okay, my look sucks. I had the, you know, the, the short hair that, you know, it, it just, it did nothing. Um, my gym wasn't as much of a focus and the tan, I just didn't have everything put together yet. Even the gear, like, you know what I mean? If I look back at that version of me now, I wouldn't have booked them. Um, but, uh, but at this point I had kind of, Started focusing on the look, I got some better gear and some nice boots, um, and they'd kind of give me a little bit of a shove, and um, I was working with Gary, and Gary was like the top heel. We were Wild Man Inc., Sexton Phoenix, Gary Williams, and Double XL. So Gary was working with all these guys, and, and, and me and Troy were like Gary's henchmen. So we were involved with that. Like I took a frog splash from Chavo, which I, I still to this day is like one of the, the best parts uh, of my career, market-wise, because um, I was a huge Eddie Guerrero fan, huge Chavo Guerrero fan, that whole Lucha Libre style um, in WCW. Like they were one of the reasons why I watched that show. And of course, Bret Hart being a, you know, a childhood hero of mine, that was awesome too. Um, and later on down the line, I ended up doing my own little program with, with Bret and Harry and... Uh, I think it was just Brad and Harry. Oh, and Jim Neidhart, but that's later on down the line if you want to go there later. A uh, couple, I think in 2013, you won the UCW title from yeah. Chris Cook. Is that, yeah. 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 Um, your thoughts on them putting the title on you after being with the company for, it was like four or five years at that point. Yeah. Um, and I remember they told me plans. Like that was actually probably supposed to happen in like 2012. And I remember they kept saying it, and then something would get changed, or they would change the booking, or whatever. And I remember at the point, going right up into it, I was like, and everyone was going, no, this is actually going to happen. And I was like, okay, we'll see. <laughs> Until I'm holding that in my hand, then, you know, then I'll believe it. Because everything had changed so much. And I remember, you know, it wasn't like a cool little moment. Um, you know, the one, two, three happened, they gave me the belt, and... Uh, a bunch of my friends came up from the back and they did the whole, you know, up on your shoulders thing. So it, it was a cool moment. And to me, it just felt like I had worked really hard for them for a long time, too. And like, you know, I was just starting out, you know, in the area. I was sometimes taking shitty pays, you know what I mean, for the amount of work that I was putting in. And then, you know, to kind of rise through the card to the top of the card, it was almost like, you know, a little bit of validation for that hard work that I put in.
Um, you started working for Red Rock Wrestling when? Um, I, I did two stints of, of Red Rock Wrestling, um, and I think that would have been probably around the same, maybe a little bit after the ECPW, so whatever. Uh, was, when was your was your first show, the Maritime Cup show in PEI? No. Did you work no, before that? No, I did a couple shows before that, too. Okay. Yeah, I did a tag with Mr. Fantastic against uh, Titus and Chittick. Right. Um, I did some other singles, and then I did the Maritime Cup, which that was a grueling night. Yeah, you worked three times that night? Three times. Yeah. Uh, Lincoln Steen, Titus, and Chris Cook. Yeah. So, yeah, that was a, a tough... Uh, you didn't really want to wear the mask nope. when you were working nope. for Red Rock Wrestling. Nope. Uh, why is that? Um, and I'm so glad that, you know, it's, so, it's full circle now, and now I'm back and I'm actually able to do my character. But looking back at it, I mean, Mike, what, Mike's a smart dude. Mike was right in putting it, whether personally I like doing it or not, I obviously went out and did it. So, you know, I knew business as well. Um, but, you know, again, I was in a situation where I'm like the smallest dude in the roster, um, you know, with a lot of bigger guys. And it's like, well, what do you do with the small dude? You give them some, you got to give them some sort of gimmick. And it did get over. And I sold a lot of merch over there. Um, and in my head at the time, and I'm glad it happened too, because in my head at the time, I understood why he did it, but it also made me understand what I needed to do to get that off of me. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, if I didn't want to be typecast as that small, skinny dude that, you know, can work, but has no look, I would have to create some sort of look for myself. And if I didn't want to be the small, skinny dude, I mean... You've had some personal transformations too. Yeah. You know that that's hard work and yeah. you have to commit yourself to it. So how bad do you want it? Do you want it bad enough to change your whole life to get it? If you do, you'll get it. Yeah, and, and that's what it was like. I didn't want to wear that mask. And, and you know, uh, growing your hair long takes a long time. <laughs> if you want a look, you better be willing to put something in it to, to, to get out of it what you want. And if you're not willing to do it, you might be stuck with the mask and that's your fault. And a couple of years later, well, like now, he has brought you back yep. as yourself yep. without the mask. Yep. You proved that you could change your physique, change mm -hmm. your attitude or whatever. Yep. Uh, your thoughts on him bringing you back now? Uh, like I said, I think it's a, a wonderful full circle. Um, and it's a great feeling. Red Rock Wrestling, man, it's, uh, it's one of the best places in the Maritimes to wrestle. Um, they draw huge every single time. Uh, you know, Mike has pretty much integrated the promotion into the community. Um, and uh, to come back, like I said, to come back as myself, my gimmick, um, you know, e even a small thing, I was like, you know, bring my own music. And it's like, yeah, that works. It's like, you know, Mike is only going to go with it if it makes sense, you know what I mean? Or if there's business behind it. So, you know, it, it kind of made me feel good and like a pat on the back, like, okay, you've, you've accomplished something, um, you know. And uh, I think my second match over there, me and Mike tagged. You know, which when I was there before, I would have been at the bottom of the bottom. And, you know, to bring me back in, it's like, no, you can hang with us. Um, it was awesome. In 2011, uh, Sexton Phoenix, now the American Patriot, Chris Cook and Keith Morrison started back up uh, New Breed Wrestling. Your thoughts back then on them starting it up? And why do you think it didn't stay running longer than it did? Did I work those shows? Uh, you worked Julian on one of them for sure. Oh, yeah. The first one. Keith had something to do with that? According to Sexton Phoenix, he did. I, I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, okay. No, I do remember uh, Troy and, and Chris. I don't yeah. remember Keith having anything to do with it, really, but I could be wrong on that. Um, but I remember Troy and Chris started to back up, and you're right, I did work Julian um, to Bird Legion, right? Yeah, I filmed that show. That's yeah, why. That, <laughs> that's right. Um, it was a packed house in DeBert. I've been yeah. to a couple of shows there before that. Yeah. And there was like eight people there. There was like 200 that place, or something I'm there. I'm telling you, night. if someone took some time to nurse that area, that place would draw big time. And IHW is coming in, uh, was it May 13th? I think so. Um, to do a show in Truro. And I'm telling you, if, if they keep hitting it, they're going to build a huge following there. Um, because when we were there early New Breed, we would draw really good in that Legion. We would pack it. We would standing room only at sometimes. Yeah, the dog. Oh, it's fine. His, it's, I feel bad for it. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, we, we would draw there. So, and then you're right. Sometimes we'd get six people. So yeah. you kind of had to be a little bit consistent with it. But uh, but no, I, I, to me, the only difference was, you know, the first run I was kind of helping with the booking and creative a little bit. And the second run I was just booked and I just worked so it was which just, would you rather would you rather be involved I'd much just, rather no I'd much rather just, just get wrestle. booked and yeah. wrestle yeah like yeah why do you think it didn't last longer than it did 
I have no idea. You don't know? No clue. Uh, I think it was just one of them things maybe where they just had to be consistent with it more. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, I personally think that if someone continuously ran, I went to an exhibition a show at the exhibition there. Right. I think yeah. that would be great yeah. if someone ran that every year. That would be huge. Yeah. Like I went to a mainstream show at the Bridgewater exhibition, and there yeah. were twenty five hundred people there. I mean, the show got canceled halfway through because the fans started to throw rocks and crap <laughs> at the ring. But that could be fixed nowadays, right? Yeah. But I it actually, could be built to that. I actually was the guy that fostered that whole exhibition. Uh, new Breed wrestling deal um, like I went down I did a little presentation and everything and uh, each year we came back we would get this flat rate and we could raise it we raised it up to where the boys were making good money and then the next year they came back to us and they said the exhibition <laughs> the exhibition went bankrupt <laughs> and they had new owners that took it over so that's why that doesn't happen anymore is the new owners aren't so they haven't really been romanced yet <laughs> but uh, yeah uh, when did you start working for IHW um 2010 maybe, I think, around that area. Uh, what were your thoughts when you finally, you, you talked earlier <coughs> about wanting to get there so bad, what yeah. were your thoughts on when you finally got there? I was scared shitless. <laughs> um, and I remember I got there and, uh, it, you know, I think at this point I knew Julian Young, Nick Teeth, Titus I met a couple times but I didn't know, know him really well, and I think that was it. And, uh, and I haven't really even been exposed to, like, French-Canadian or Acadian culture very much. <laughs> so I get to this locker room, we're all speaking French. Um, but I remember there was a huge compliment on it, and it was, um, they booked Chris Cook, and it was the debut of Chris Cook in IHW. And um, they, uh, they messaged Chris, and they said, bring someone from Nova Scotia that you can have a good match with. And he messaged me, and he was like, this is what they said, I want you to come with me, fuck it, and we'll tear, tear it up. So uh, so we get there, and I remember they said Chris was the heel, so Chris's music's playing, he's on the way to the ring, and I'm standing behind this big screen and this production that looks so good, um, and I was like nervous, my stomach was tight, and, and you know, I don't often get nervous, but I was nervous in the sense that I knew, again, I had like one opportunity to prove myself. I was basically brought up to be like a, a not necessarily a feeder, but someone that can make Chris look good. So I was like, damn it, that's what I'm going to do. Um, and I got out there, and, and we started rocking and rolling in the match, and we hit a couple good spots, and then all of a sudden the crowd's, I, I'm in a chin, he's got me a chin lock, and the crowd's chanting my name for me to come back. We ended up having this great little match, and uh, I think Serge Doucette, is that his last name? Serge? Yeah, his first name's Serge. Yeah, I Serge. don't know his last name for sure, but... I think it's Doucette. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, we came back to the curtain, he was like, that was one hell of a match, I want you back next month, and I want you back next month. And it was like, holy shit. And I remember talking to Julian years later, he said, uh, you know, I think we were talking about another young guy that's trying to get in right now, and, and we were telling my story, he was like, we brought you in as a feeder, and you got over. And, you know, we don't book people that don't get over. So if you continue to get over, we continue to book guys, you know what I mean? Um, and that's, that's the whole trick, ladies and gentlemen. You get that one opportunity, make it count. That doesn't mean go, you know, put yourself over at the expense of what they wanted me to do. They wanted me to get Chris Cook over, make Chris Cook look good, which I did, but you can do it in a way that you also make yourself look good, too. That's the whole point. That's yeah. the whole point. <laughs> at the end of it, you know what? If he's the big monster and he just runs right through me, well, he didn't even have a challenge. It does nothing to increase his stature of, of being, you know... But if I can give him a little bit of a challenge, then he overcomes it, then, you know, and vice versa, right? Um, so, yeah, so then they started bringing me back. They started using me, and uh, and I kind of went into the fold a little bit, and, uh, yeah. They've been using you quite on a regular basis now. Uh, they just celebrated their 10th mm -hmm. anniversary show last September. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people say that that was one of the best shows that the Maritime that had the Cosmo in show, years. Right? Yep, yeah, with okay. Jake Roberts. Yep. Uh, what are your memories on that and being involved in such a big show for them? I was the opener on that, me and Julian, again. Um, uh, and uh, I remember uh, I got there earlier on in the day, so I, I seen the venue and I'm like, man, this is going to be crazy. If this place is packed, this is it's just going to look ridiculous. And uh, so I always, too, I, I, I try not to look at the draw at all. Until I get out, that's when I'll see the draw, and then that way I can kind of organically react to it. So I avoid seeing it. And I just remember people come back and go, man, there's a lot of people here. Man, there's a lot of people here. And uh, 
so me and Julian are on. Julian goes out first, and I do the thing where I come out backwards, right? Yeah. And uh, so I do my thing, I come out backwards, so I still haven't seen the crowd. And when I spun around, I'm telling you, it almost like maybe took a step back, like how on top of the ring the people looked, how many, you know, and the people were reacting, and it, it was just amazing. It was an amazing feeling. And uh, me and Julian went out, had a good little match. Uh, cheated on and he super kicked me at the end of it. It was just a wicked moment. The whole crowd just reacted to it, and uh, yeah, it was a great venue. And that that night, I think the, the rest of the night too, it just kept building and building and building. And the main event happened. It was a perfect main event for that show, and yeah, it was awesome. It was probably one of the best shows around here in a while. Uh, did you ever work for Mainstream Wrestling, uh, run by Devin nope. Chittick? Why? He 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 ran legitimately right. ran more shows than anyone else here. Mm -hmm. Ever, yeah, um, or at least in the within this generation. Yeah, um, how come you never worked for him? Um, when I first came down to Halifax um, and started working with, I think actually my first match in UCW was me and Troy. I might be wrong on this, but he has like a computer brain, so he would know. He does, and he remembers yeah. everything. Chris cooks the same way. It's uncanny. <laughs> like I don't remember what I ate for breakfast. This morning. <laughs> um, but I think it was. Me and Troy versus Devin Chittick and Alexander Saint Tyson. Um, and uh, then that's when I first met Devin. And then Chuck and Devin had some sort of falling out. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the whole famous, you know, I, I don't know if anyone else has ever heard this before, before but the, if you work for me, <laughs> you can't work for him, right? Believe it or not. Um, and, and that happened. So I was working for Chuck, um, and Devin was kind of doing his own thing. What are your thoughts on the whole? You can't work. You if you work for me, you can't work for them. I think it's ridiculous. Um, I really do. Um, I. It's one of these things too, where you know, it, it's really the the performer's choice. And here's what I say to people that are stuck, kind of in that thing. It's like, who's gonna butter my bread better? You know, sometimes that might be financially. Sometimes that might be exposure. Sometimes that might be place on the card. What are you looking to get out of this business? Are you looking for some sort of personal gratification? Are you looking for money? Are you looking for exposure so that you can get more money later on? You have to look at what you personally are trying to get out of it. Um, to me, it makes more business sense to go who's going to pay you more and use you more. Don't know about anyone else, but uh, I, would rather, uh, I would rather work 30 days in a month and job every single night than work for my comp the competition that if I work here I can't work here and win the main event twice in a month. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, because you're going to get better out of having those matches even if you have uh, you know a, a shitty opponent you know or, or matches aren't going well you're learning ways to get around that in the future. You're going to become a better performer which means you're going to have more value to the business which means we can do more business which means I'm more of an asset in the business which means I can ask for more money. Yeah, that's pretty much exactly the way I feel about it. If, especially for someone new getting in, if they're gonna, you want them to work for you, let them go work thirty matches for somebody else. Because when they come back to you, yeah. they're gonna be better. You just go to the, get out of wrestling school. Yeah. We're gonna put you in this main card. We have three shows in the next six months, and on those three shows, you're gonna wrestle this high caliber guy. Well, if he goes out and fucks up and has a bad match the first time, he has to wait two and a half weeks to get the next opportunity where, you know, if you're putting someone in a, a, a you know, perceptionist reality, and a lot of the fans, like I know we have a really strong wrestling community here in, in the Maritimes, but a lot of your casual fans that come into a show that maybe they see a Chavo Guerrero on the poster and they go, oh, I'll go check that out, that may not know the local scene, um, they're not going to get that. Um... I lost my train of thought. Dude, Scott, help me out here. What was uh, your question again? Uh, getting someone going to uh, getting work, right? Like getting thirty matches somewhere else, right. coming back to this one so promotion. So perception is reality. Better. So if they see this guy's fighting for the belt, uh, you know, and they don't know our scene, they they just go, okay, he must be a really good wrestler. But he's had four fucking matches. So, you know, versus, you know, going out there and getting as much work as you can, and then by the time you come down to match two, maybe you've had five or six matches. Mm -hmm. So, you know, any jitters or any fumbling or any second-guessing yourself, you can work that out. 
and you shouldn't be in that position anyways until you've worked out of <laughs> that, you know that to me is a detriment to the business we want to make you know we want to make this look good we don't want two guys that don't know what the fuck they're doing in there fumbling around that does that does nothing that hurts my money actually because if someone goes to and watches that show and say you know this this town and then I'm doing a bigger show in this town and they see that poster after watching that show and they go well oh that sucks so this must suck too your casual fan you know and, and I think we would like to bring some casual fans in because I think if That's they the see the, the quality <laughs> product, you know, they're going to become regulars, but you have to have quality product in front of them all the time. Uh, last week, Dave Boyce did an interview <laughs> with uh, Jason Mosier on uh, Hit the Road with Dave Boyce. Um, he mentioned an issue going back to something that happened in Indian Brook with J.P. Sims. <laughs> uh, a lot of people were wondering what he was talking about. The infamous, it, well, what, what was he talking about? It, 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 well, okay, so he tried to make it sound like like some big cataclysmic thing happened in Indian Brook, and that kicked off this whole war between me and JP. And, and I don't, I don't think it was so much that. I think there was an incident there that uh, that pissed me off, but. You know, at the time there was other things with me and him going on too. So that that might have been the catalyst, I guess, where where maybe I, you know, I was feeling it, you know, fuck JP before that. But I think that situation was where I finally would say, like, you know what, fuck JP, and I was I was very open with it, even to him. Um, but no, it, it was just a stupid thing where uh, New Breed booked a show in Indian Brook, and fucking I went over on JP. And then Chuck booked Indian Brook. It was like almost like six months to a year later. And it basically, like we had this setup where there was like this local kid from Indian Brook. I say kid, but he was probably like 18 or 19. Huge wrestling fan. He was one of the, the people that I think he outreached to us and then got us the contact info to come in. He was such a big wrestling fan. He just wanted to bring wrestling to the town. And I'm like on Indian Brook the first time and I'm a baby face. And I'm like, fuck, how am I going to get over? And uh, I'm like, I got it. I'll bring the, I did a promo and then I ended up bringing, I think his name was Lloyd, Lloyd to the ring with me and everyone knew Lloyd from the community so was, he got to come down and, and corner me um, and then me and JP did the, the thing, I think JP went with the chair and Lloyd pulled the chair out and I rolled him up or hit him with my finish or something um, and then like six months to a year later Chuck comes back and he books literally the exact same thing only Lloyd comes down to the ring with JP and I'm heel and we do almost the exact same finish. And I'm like, that was a fuck you. It felt like a fuck you anyways. And this is at the time where JP's going, I don't do jobs and shit like that. And that just rubbed me the wrong way. And and yeah, the snowball started. But it's not like there was a fight. There wasn't a fight or an incident. No one got stabbed. <laughs> anything like that. It was just, I think, after that, that's when I was like, you know what, fuck him. Playing that shit. Uh, when did you first get contacted by Jason and Tyler to work for Russell Center? Wait, were you on their first show? Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it, it was a weird situation because I was working for, like, they had just started and, and all of a sudden, like, I think they co did a show with Chuck or something. Yeah, like, like the first half was UCW and the second half was <laughs> Russell Center. Matt Stryker was here. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Imagine sitting down with Matt Stryker while he's trying to understand the logic of <laughs> running a show like that, and I'm going. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so uh, I was working for Chuck, and then I, I forget, I think that's how I ended up stopping working for Chuck, actually. Um, I just went from UCW right into Russell Center. Uh, your thoughts on their first show, they brought in a huge name, AJ Styles. Uh, did you think that from that show that they would continue to grow from where they were, or what were your opinion on them? Starting a wrestling promotion. Was that the show when he did the run-in? I No, I think he worked JP. That wasn't the first time he was there, though, was it? That was the first, I think. Okay, wait, yeah. Yeah, I think you're I right. Might I might be think, wrong, but... No, I think he came in, he did the thing with JP, then uh, he, Daniels got the belt, and then he came back. Yeah, I missed the show where he came back, so that would have been, awesome. been like August. Yeah. Um, I was in LA. That was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the surprise. surprise reveal. A funny backstory about that. Uh, Justin, Justin Parsons. What? Cody. How do you say his name? Justin Parsons. Justin Cody. Parsons, Cody. David. Michael. Andrew. The guy with the million first names. <laughs> um, I think he picked him up at the airport. So we're all out back. I had already wrestled, and uh, 
the back of the forum it's like a very narrow driveway right up to the doors and uh, this car is f I'm telling you it's fucking flying I'm like they're not gonna stop they're gonna fucking run us right over and then they, <laughs> but they stopped and I was fucking pissed because I was like that was fucking reckless and what if you know you had it smoked us it was that quick and then AJ Styles walks out and I'm like I don't know what because the show is on the, the main event's going on at this moment and I'm like yeah there was a Thought he might not get there in time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I fucking, I'm like, all right, I'm fucking following him in there to see what the fuck's going on, and uh, and yeah, that pop was was amazing. Uh, the first show, I don't know, I I can't even remember. I think they drew well. Yeah, oh yeah. They drew really well. Yeah. And uh, but to me, it was the era of when he when AJ came back and did that surprise return that I was like, wow. And this place is on fire. They were doing the Wrestle Center chance, and and at that point, the draw was even bigger. And yeah, I did an interview with Tyler. Um, when was that? January, I think, of this year. And uh, he mentioned how you didn't want to lose to pretty much anybody. Uh, That's not he, true. he he specifically mentioned Nick Diggs. Um, That's not true. I put Nick Diggs over twice, I think. Right, but he said you didn't want to, but you agreed to do it. Uh, what were, What are your thoughts on no, that's on that? bullshit? And that was right around the era. I think uh, I had done the Hit the Road with Dave Boy's show, and I did um, Brian Langell's What's the Finish. Yeah. And then all of a sudden he comes out with this video saying, "Oh, I didn't want to do jobs," and uh, he said something about me being I wanted to be put with younger guys so I could put the fucking match together and shit like that. And, I got news to you, Tyler Burns, and I'll tell you this right now. You know, unless I'm working a veteran, and, and even if if you are working a veteran, if you get stumped for a spot and, and you have an idea that works, you should say it. You should never let anyone dictate the match to you. Can, you know, unless you are a rookie and it is a veteran that's putting this shit together. But if I'm working a guy like Suave, like me and him are back and forthing it. If I'm working with another guy and he can't back and forth it, I will go. Well, what if you did this or? You know, what's your big move? Okay, how do we build a spot around that move? Um, but I think I'm just creative like that. And, and, you know, fucking, you know, I've been in situations with Pete where we're talking spots back and forth. Like, you know, it's never a matter of, you know, because they're a younger guy on the card that, you know, I'd be able to put a match together with. I would like to think that I could try to put a match together with anybody. Um, so that's bullshit, and uh, and the job thing, that's stupid too. I, I fucking, I've argued to put people over with those guys before, um, and I said too, um, one of my favorite matches there was the single match that I did, singles match I did with Tommy Starr. I put him over. I think put him over clean. Um, and it was one of my favorite matches. So, you know, I've said to many guys before too, I would rather lose a great match than win a shitty match any fucking day of the week. So winning and losing, that's never never been a issue or a problem or Tyler's talking out of his ass if he thinks so. Uh, there was a match, I don't remember when it was, but I refed it, uh, you had with Matt Seidel. Um, talk about what, what happened during that match. That was crazy. I think you're going to talk about that on my shoot interview when I interview you and I go, Harold, <laughs> what the fuck? Um... I think it was April or... I don't know how much of the curtain I want to pull back on this. Let's, um, let's just say... Um, I, first of all, I think Matt Seidel is a wicked performer. Like, I, I won't ever take anything away. Great worker, great guy, um, personality-wise, all that shit. But we meshed, like, peanut butter and canoe. Like, I have, <laughs> you know... And, and he was just coming off an injury. I think he, he injured himself in Ring of Honor like the week before, um, you know, and then we had limitations on the back of what we could do and what we couldn't do, and, and, and the, yeah, I just, it did, didn't clash right, and then the finish, um, I don't know, what, what did you fuck up, Harold? Uh, no, 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 I'll talk about it. <laughs> all right, all right, okay, um, and I'll, I'll tell you if it's true or not. What do you mean if it's true? I was, <laughs> I, was I was there. Too. I was there too, remember. He, he told me it was a sharpshooter finish. Yeah. Uh, he didn't seem very pleased about it. No. Nope. Um, and I asked him, as I ask everybody, because I don't want to mess it up. Right. I was like, are you going to do an MMA tap? Or right. are you going to do a pro wrestling tap? Right. He's like, oh no, pro wrestling tap, out front so everybody can see that's the way it's done, right? But I'm, I'm, I'm going to sell I'm gonna sell it, sell it, then bang, bang, bang. Okay. I was like, sweet. The reversal for the sharpshooter is to reach around and grab someone's boot. 
True. He reached around to grab your boot mm. and tap. tapped on my boot. I thought he was grabbing your boot to do the reversal of the sharpshooter. He's fucking mad. Because I, he swung at me. <laughs> because he didn't do the tap out front, I didn't call it. He did, it. though. He did end up doing the tap He did front. after he uh, swung at me. Uh, he was like, he was like, I didn't tap. I was like, he says to me in the sharpshooter, I tapped. I say, yeah, no, I you didn't. I heard that, too. I said, no, you didn't. I heard that, too. And then he swings at me and then taps out front. Yeah. Um, I remember. <laughs> all, I, all I remember about that was, and... and I was a little confused. We, we talked about the, it after, me and him, and it was fine. With the with the boot thing, too. And yeah. uh, I remember I had him, and I felt him tap on my boot, and then I didn't hear a bell. And then <laughs> I could feel him trying to push his legs out of it. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I didn't hear the bell, so I ain't fucking letting go. And then fucking, I could hear you guys kind of had your little exchange, and then boom, 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 yeah. and I heard the bell, and that was it. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll take responsibility for that. Like, I, I should have called the tap I was just waiting for what he told me but I yeah. should have known that he maybe he would change it or not but I legitimately thought he was going to go for the reversal not get it and then tap yeah. that's why I didn't call it yeah. but uh, they edited it on TV so yeah, like, yeah. yeah that's <laughs> the whole story now yeah. <laughs> it's really because you fucked me over for yeah, time I did the real thing that happened because I, I wouldn't do jobs yeah, that's right you're a dick no <laughs> I'll edit that <laughs> um Let's see here. There was another situation involving uh, the Maritime Wrestling All Star Show in Amherst and Wrestle Center. You worked max power that night uh, in Amherst for the Maritime Wrestling All Stars. Uh, you lost to Max. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't seem to have any. It uh, yeah. Didn't seem I to have any issues with up. it at yeah, all. I didn't. But, uh, but then. That there was, was a yeah. three-way conversation going on between me, you, and Tyler. You fucking remember everything. I you? do. And uh, <laughs> you were upset because the... Ma okay, here's my perspective right. of what right. I was told. All right. Uh, Tyler said to me... Or no, I was talking to you first. Yeah. And you said... I asked you to take it down. You asked me to take it down. Um, but you told me that they asked me to take... They asked you they, to tell me to take it down. They fucking... Okay. But, and Tyler said, that's not true. We would never ask you to take something down. I will so fucking show you on my phone. I still have the messages, today. too. That's why uh, I was asking. Uh, okay. I can show you that on my phone. Yeah. That's that's completely horseshit. And, and even Mike Miles right now is probably rolling over on his side because he knows, um, and you yourself, you know, I, hey, you taped the show last night. Can you send me my match? I like to watch everything. Yep. Not to mark out, but to, to watch and fucking find holes in my game because, and then I can tighten them. Um, but I'm on anyone that films it. I'm on them to get that match right away. I wake up the next day, and uh, and this you know goes to their story too because he said, "Oh, we never said that we were going to put the the title on them or that you were going to put JP over or whatever." Um, they were gearing up to do this run to go with me for the for the belt, and that's what he used against me. He messaged me. He goes, "Dude, how the fuck, how the fuck are we gonna push you to the title?" when you can't even beat Max Power. And I'm like, motherfucker, it's a work, and it's in Amherst, and like, you know, fucking 200 people see it online. I'd love to believe my YouTube channel go, has that power, but I don't Holy think it does. Holy <laughs> fucking hell. And he was like, dude, you got, you're friends with Harold, fucking, you gotta get him to take it down. And, and I can show you the matches. It wasn't like I went, yeah, gee, okay, boss. I was like, dude, fuck, like, I argued it. That just leave it alone. The yeah. 200 people that watch it, guess what? They go to IHW. Guess what? They go to Red Rock. Guess what? They go to Wrestle Center. They know it's a fucking work. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah. And then, then Jason messaged me on it, too. I'm like, dude, you got to get this. So I had Jason and Tyler going, wow, we're going to push it, blah, 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 blah. And fucking, and then finally I messaged you, and I was like, dude, would you just take it down? Like, yeah. like I very begrudgingly messaged you yeah. and said that. Like, yeah. it wasn't like I was like, fucking, please, yeah. fucking. No, no, and, and as soon as you, it was funny, because as soon as you messaged me telling me to take it down, Tyler messaged me telling me that he didn't tell you to tell me to take it I down. Can, I literally that can show you that message. Yeah. That's bullshit. No, that's, that's fine. Yeah. I, I, I believe you. Um, so, yeah, they said that that was going to, hurt your match with Christopher I, I Daniels. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> During your time with Wrestle Center, you uh, rose through the ranks. Um, what are your thoughts on how you got to be in the main event of their last show? Um, <clears throat> when I started, there was a, like a little bit of truth um, to what uh, Tyler was saying when he said I wanted to work with the younger guys. And that, that was, there was truth to that. Um, 
I had, when I started there, I was still working for Chuck. Um, and I think I still had Chuck's belt, uh, the ECW belt at the time. And I remember it was a concern that me working both shows, um, if they were to do something where they were going to promote behind me or build me up, then what if something happened on Chuck's show to undermine that? Um, so what I had said to them was, uh, and at the time, me and Shane Stevens were coming down um, and working with uh, Joey Giles and uh, Nick Diggs and Tommy Starr. Um, and Chuck just had like a, the ring set up in some like training barn. And it was summertime. And uh, me and Shane would go down like every weekend and, and help train these guys. So I liked them. They all worked hard. The three of them worked hard. So I was like, why not do something with me and them? You know, they're, they're, you know, at the time they were brand new, um, basically. And, uh, and, you know, I said, you know, now something happens there. You know, I'm only in a small little angle here helping someone out, so it doesn't matter. Um, and if you watch, like, the first, I don't know, five or six Wrestle Center shows, or maybe even more, those are the guys that I worked with. I worked with uh, uh, Nick Diggs, my first, the first Wrestle Center match. Um, and then uh, me and Nick Diggs, I believe, did a tag against Joey and Tommy Starr, uh, Greaser and Tommy Starr. And then it spawned into, uh, they did a feud with them, I did a feud with them, but basically I was put with those guys. And uh, um, I think uh, just through like hard work, I guess, I ended up getting over with the crowd. And, you know, once you're over with the crowd, then you have more value and you can be placed, you know, in, in bigger situations, you know, with bigger responsibilities. I had stopped working with Chuck, so whatever worry they had over that was was gone. And, uh, yeah, I think it was very organic. They, they certainly didn't go, okay, we're going to build this guy up to be the next guy. Um, I think uh, the crowd did that, and it got to a point where they were like, okay, we almost have to go with him now. You know what I mean? So, uh, Do you think you got your push because a lot of the other talent left? No. I think... Uh, I think if the other talent still had been there, I mean, you know, when I had started kind of this upward swing, everyone was still there. Mm -hmm. Brody was still there. Suave was still there. Everyone was still there. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, at one point, and I dare say it, that me and Suave were getting the biggest reactions out of everybody. I wouldn't disagree, um, yeah. You know, and impact houses. Um, so I think... Uh, you know what? I think me versus Suave for their belt at Wrestle Center would have did phenomenal business. Um, we had wrestled a couple times and it was always great. Um, but uh, but no, I don't think uh, I don't think I got the push because no one was there. I think I got the push because I, I was good business to push me. Would you attribute your over your overall popularity now to how Russell Center booked you? No, no. Um, I think um, if you go to Moncton where I wrestled. Um, you know, they have very limited exposure to what Wrestle Center does. I, I'm over there. If you go to PEI, um, which, you know, is a completely different crowd, I'm over there. Um, I go to Newfoundland, um, you know, a couple times a month, um, and I'm over there. So I don't think Wrestle Center's how they booked me, um, you know, I, I think it, the exposure that I got there, I'll never complain about, that I was seen in front of more eyes you know, in this province than any other place I've ever worked. Um, but yeah, no, I think, uh, you Do know. Do you think more people know who you are now because of them? Um, I, well, like I just said, I mean, I, I can never say anything about the exposure. So there was a lot of exposure. Um, but uh, I remember Tyler said to me once, and it pissed me off, he said something, something along the lines of uh, well, how over or how many people... We were talking about something, and um, he was saying something about, uh, well, everyone's popping for you now. And how many people popped for you when you worked in UCW? And I said, if there was 23 people and I was working babyface, I could make them all pop for me. If there was 115 people, I could make them pop for me. Yeah, it's great that I'm in a, a you know, there's 800 people here, and I'm making 800 people pop. But that's not because of you. You brought the 800 people here, but you know what I mean? It's me that did it. Um... So, and I feel, you know, that's kind of like a metaphor for the whole thing. Yeah, they, I got in front of way more eyes, but, you know, if I sucked, that wouldn't matter if a million people saw me. Well, what are your thoughts on how the whole, your last match with Wrestle Center and JP came about? 
how it came about or how I felt about the match or uh, how you felt about leading up to the match, the match itself. It, it was a pretty big deal, and it had a lot of attention online uh, going into that show. It was stressful. Like I stressed for three weeks to a month about it, um, which I don't like doing. I, I love wrestling because it's fun, and that none of that was fun. None of it was fun. Um, and, and I did like you know when they say like uh, you know wrestling's about working the fans. I felt like I was being worked in a bunch of different ways, uh, a bunch of different times. And you know, I, you don't work the guys that work for you. You just don't. Um, and I felt like you know they knew there was a shitty situation. It was almost like you know what it felt like to me. It felt like the fucking guy at the bar that your little Weasley buddy that picks the fucking fight and holds your coat while you go fight. You know what I mean? Yeah. And doesn't answer the phone when you're in the drunk tank trying to get out. You know that's how I felt. That's how that situation made me feel. Um, you left after you wanted to be the big star, obviously. Everybody does wants to be the big star in the promotion. You left when you finally got that big match. Why did that... Um, why? Like, you finally got that big push uh, that you wanted. Yeah. You were in the main event. Uh, and why did you decide to leave after they finally went yeah. with you? I said that on, on Dave's show, too. I left I left a wicked fucking spot. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and... and how long was I there at Wrestle Center for? Two years? Yeah. And literally starting as like the prelim guy, you know, whether Tyler says I don't want to do the job or not, but the prelim guy putting people over to, you know, getting, you know, that, you know, babyface spot at that too. You know, it, it feels great working at Newfoundland, in Newfoundland being the top heel, yeah. but to be a top babyface is a lot harder because you have to endear yourself to everyone to the point where they like you better than all the other babyfaces. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's hard to do. And, uh, I just, man, it just, like I said, the whole thing with it not being fun, it wasn't fun. Yeah. Um, I don't like scripts. Um, I don't. And uh, you can ask Jason and Tyler on any interview. I would look at a page and go, I can't say that, and I won't say that. But reading this, I know what you are trying to say or convey, so I will read this and fucking say it how I can. And I'd get heat and shit about that. Like, yeah, like... Just stupid stuff like that. I, I, you know, it was just frustrating, and you know, I what I said before too about you know I said um, I'd rather lose a great match than win a shitty one, and uh, and that's I guess I could use that metaphor for that too, and that's kind of how that felt. Um, your thoughts on the reaction the crowd gave you that night? I, I was in the ring for that, and it was, in my opinion, it was pretty pretty outstanding. Yeah. What were your thoughts when you came? Th I remember your music played a couple of times. Yeah. I remember, look, because the deal was they didn't know if you were going to be there or not because yeah. your music played a couple of times. I remember looking at the faces in the front row because I know who they all are as, yeah. as friends. Yeah. And uh, they looked at me like, is he not coming? They were getting legitimately mad. Yeah. And then you popped through the curtain and they went nuts. What are yeah. your thoughts on the support that they gave you through that situation yeah. and during that match? Because they were all on you or yeah. for you. Yeah. Um, again, that day, and uh, Dave Boyce did a documentary on that day. And if you watch that day, I wasn't like smiley and happy and all that. Like, I was stressed going through through all of it and uh, it was surreal and it felt good because I remember it was after intermission I think it was the match after intermission we pulled up by the doors and I'm getting ready to go out so it's a ball of stress ball of stress I'm already geared up I got track pants on and a, a loose shirt and I got my gear on all underneath it and uh, I remember I walked in and uh, sh shredded the clothes off and boom I was in my wrestling gear I soaked my hair and then when I walked through the curtain and the and the, the reaction that I did get, um, like that stress just kind of just went poof. And it was like, you know what? I had so many conflicting feelings. Um, I was mad before I went out and then, you know, and almost like, yeah, fuck them. I can't wait to leave. But then when I went out there, it's like, man, this is the part that I'm going to miss. You know what I mean? The, the, you know, I forget. I don't know what the draw was, but there was a lot of people. Yeah. And, and that place does pack. You know, the, and the, the fans there are so smart. They know everyone's gimmick. They have their own little taunts and chants and nicknames for, for everyone and everything. Um, 
you know, and, and that's what I'm leaving. You know, I'm leaving a lot of bullshit behind, but I'm also leaving a lot of, of good things. So it was very conflicting when the match was over. Like, legitimately, I was a little bit choked up and a little bit emotional. And, yeah. Your thoughts on how that match turned out with your beef with JP? And uh, did you were you happy with the final product? Um... As far as what it accomplished with like Shane coming in and kind of getting the rub and I think I, I beat this to death in other interviews but my whole thing was you know I felt I felt that JP was disrespecting the business and not doing what all of us are, are you know it's entrained in us to do and that's you know you said it earlier but a match ever both guys should look better at the end of it that's kind of the whole point and um and I felt like JP wasn't doing that, and by me putting JP over, it was it was giving him that rub that he wouldn't give to anyone else. And the finish ended up being, you know, Shane was the star of it. Shane was the deciding factor of it. And you know, now Shane's going on uh, their next show to fight uh, Mikey Mikey Speedball. Is that his name? Uh, Speedball, Speedball Bailey. Mikey. I don't. Speedball I don't. Know. It's, it's, it's all those names. I don't know Sorry. what order. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. So I mean, you know. Props to him and, and to take that and run with it and you know I'll be okay. I, I uh, <laughs> you know I've already wrestled in Halifax already so and, and we killed it. So uh, similar to last year, uh, JP left Russell Center, returned to UCW. Mm -hmm. uh, you did the same thing this year. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that come about for you? Um, we were uh, fuck. Wow, well, I'll really break kayfabe on this because it's it's kind of a funny story. Um. Uh, we were all watching WrestleMania, big or not WrestleMania, Royal Rumble, big group of the guys, and uh, I freaked out. Greaser goes, I think I want to wrestle one more time in Halifax, but I wish I knew a place where I could wrestle. And I go, well, Chuck's doing a show. I wonder if I contact him and say, hey, why don't we have Joey's last match and I'll wrestle him. Uh, and I sold it, the, when I contacted Chuck, That's I, I didn't say, hey, I'm looking for a booking. I was like, hey, what do you think of this match? Can we do this match at your show? Um, and he was all for it, 100%. Um, and yeah, uh, that's how it happened. Um, at a TCW show last fall, um, you had a confrontation with Cyril's brother. Um, I talked about this with the interview I did yeah. with Cyril. Uh, what are your thoughts on that whole situation? You're such a fucking jitster. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, see, first of all, yeah, I'll, like I'll say that I didn't agree with uh, Cyril bringing this up on your show. Uh, it's a little bit tight with Cyril for putting. I I don't think that this is the the place or the forum to talk about something like that. But I guess it, the whole story or parts of the story are, are out there, and I'm sure I'll tell my side of the story. And, He's told his side of the story, and somewhere in the middle is what happened. Uh, but uh, I felt really rotten about how that situation played out, but it didn't play out kind of the way that he said it, it, it did. You know, I didn't just pluck someone and start smashing their head off the cement. That did not happen like that at all whatsoever. Um, we were invited to the show, and Cyril and I had beef over something that happened even prior to that, but that's not... Don't need, even need to go into that, but we we kind of had this little beef, and then we reconnected. And we we were burying the beef. And this is the first time me and Cyril are going to to speak to each other since the original beef, and uh, and he I was invited there as a guest. Um, we showed up at the end of it, like after intermission. I think I, I seen uh, Mike's match, or they had a multi man run in or something at the end, and I thought it was really good. Um, and I, I said to Sarah, man, that you guys closed the show really good. And I, you know, things were, were good. We were leaving. Everything was on a positive note. Um, and then as we were leaving, um, someone had a TCW jersey on. And I said, sweet TCW shirt, a jersey, where did you get it? And the guy goes, underneath your mom. And I'm like, you know, at this point, I'm 34 years old. Your mom jokes really don't fucking phase me. You know, I've been in the ring, you know, with, you know, 500 people screaming, you suck, and, you know, calling me gay, and making fun of me, and making fun of my hair, and this, that, none of that shit bothers me at this point, um, but I was like, I felt disrespected, so I walked back, and I go, Are you, what did you just say, 
And the guy comes up to me and immediately recognizes me and goes, oh shit, I didn't know it was you. And I still felt pissed because I was like, okay, so what if I'm a fan? Do you know what I mean? Sure. And I didn't know this was Cyril's brother. Um, I said, what if I was a fan? Like, dude, I wasn't trying to be a smart ass. Like, fucking, I was just asking. So we're exchanging back for he apologizes. And then as this, you know, it's like kind of like a heated conversation. And as we have this heated conversation, this other guy comes out and he's like, tries to get in between us. He's like, what the fuck's going on? And I simply repeated the story of what just happened to this person that just arrived. And uh, so as I'm telling it, this dude that said it is getting all fired up and he's pacing and he's looking at me and he's like getting pissed. And so as I'm telling the guy the story, I, uh, he goes, uh, well, I said, I'm sorry. And he moved at me. And I'm telling you, when he moved at me, I took him down. I took him down. We went down hard. He went to go back up. I gave him basically like a go behind and brought him down again harder. Um, and uh, he went to go back up and I hit him once. That was it. And Shane Stevens was standing right there, and he get he can sit he as soon as I hit him, he went limp, and I just stopped. That was it. And we were done. He didn't try to get back up. He didn't try to come fight me again. Anything like that. I didn't smash his head. I gave him a double leg and a go behind, and we and I took him down twice, and punched him once. And uh, so I'm like, holy fuck, let's we gotta go. So we we'll get back to the car. And here comes Cyril and like five guys. So I turn around. I'm like, all right. I walk back up, and he goes, Steve, what the fuck did you just do to my brother? And it was like, if I could have face-palmed, you know what I mean? Like I said, we were trying to bury this beef. This is the first time we're hanging out, and I'm like, oh, the loudmouth drunk asshole was your brother. Fuck. You know, and so I felt bad how it went down. Um, his brother did aggressively come at me, and I defended myself, and I don't think I used any more force than I needed. I took him down the first time. He tried to get back up. I'm not going to let him get it back up and swing at me. Stuck him down the second time, he tried to get back up again, alright, popped him once, he didn't try to get back up, that was it. And uh, so that's the story, Cyril. Uh, would you be open to talking to Cyril's brother and Cyril to uh, I told him that, to I actually, and that has nothing to do with bookings whatsoever. I actually emailed Cyril uh, recently, and because and, we had seen each other at that UCW show, and I said, uh, you know, I... Wish we could put bygones, we got bygones, water on the bridge type of thing. I said, you know, I feel bad. Because whether, whether his brother was a drunk loudmouth or not, like, you know, if that interview was true and he was passing out and, you know, I did knock him out when I punched him, but it, that's that's why it wasn't, I wasn't smashing his head off the ground. Fuck. Um, but yeah, just out of feeling bad that, you know, fuck, this guy got fucked up and, you know, my apology wouldn't be, hey, I'm sorry I was 100% in the wrong. It'd be like, hey, man, I'm sorry you got hurt. Right. I wish we both had acted differently. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You're open to working with him, though? I, I told yeah. him that, yeah. flat out. I told him that flat out. All right. Um, another person that has a slight issue with you. Uh, oh, fuck, man. Um, Heat magnet. Alexander Saint, uh, Narcissus Saint, right, is yeah. very open with not liking you. Well, I wouldn't know that because he's blocked me, so he's invisible. What happened there? I have no clue. So, we worked together in New Breed Wrestling. We worked together in uh, UCW. I thought me and him had actually, you know, some really great matches in UCW. This was when he was in shape, past tense. Um, and we had great matches, I thought. And we got along good. And he lived in Churro. And I would pop over and we'd hang out. And, you know, all, all, like everything was, was great between us. He's a really easygoing guy, too. So it, it, I even find it weird that I have some sort of beef with him. Because when you talk to him, he's not an aggressive guy. He's not an alpha male. He's very calm and very quiet. Um, so uh, has he said anything lately? Um, he's was, not like, on okay. Facebook anymore. All right, cool. So uh, This was like a year or so ago. So... Um, so yeah, so we're, we're all friends, friends, blah, 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 blah. Uh, he used to make his own gear. So uh, I picked him up. I took him to Fabric Villa. I was like, I will buy fabric and you fabric if you just make me fucking a pair of trunks. Um, and uh, it took forever to get them back. And then when I finally got them back, they looked like bathing suit bottoms that like a 300 pound woman would wear. I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck am I supposed to do with this? Like, I can't wear this. And I'm like, dude, you got to make me something else. And that was it. And then, um, uh, did I stop working for Chuck? I, we kind of just stopped working together, and I don't think, I think he stopped working for Chuck or something. 
And then fucking all of a sudden, as soon as, you know, like I think it was during the Wild Man Inc. days, because Troy was really good friends with him. Yeah, and Troy was the is. Wild Man yeah. Inc. And I'm like, dude, what the fuck is Tyson's fucking problem? And he's like, I don't know, man. He just, he does this, whatever. And so anyway, so, so he blocks me, but I'm getting people, you know, sending me screenshots and shit like that of, you know, him fucking shitting on me for no, no reason whatsoever. And the stuff that he, sh that he was shitting on me about, like, it just made him look stupid because it was like, well, obviously you're wrong. Um, and, uh, so anyways, fast forward to the night that I win Chalk's belt. Fuck in. And this is after probably like two years of shit talking. We've never been in the same locker room. That was always my motto. And if you watch, if someone talks shit on me online, I very rarely, if ever, say anything back whatsoever. Because I always believe, especially with wrestling in the Maritimes, there will be a show that we're booked on. Yeah. And I will save it till then. And when I see you then, I will talk to you about it then. Um, and that's what it was like. He was writing all this shit and I was kind of just storing it. And then it's my big night. And uh, boom, he walks to the locker room. I'm like, all right, definitely taking him aside before he goes. Um, so then I'm outside having a cigarette later on in the evening. And Tyson comes out and he's like, all right, everybody, peace out. And sticks his hand out to shake my hand, which is hilarious because if he hates me so much to not say a word. And he didn't. Not one fucking word. Um, and, and you call me out on it if I'm wrong. Uh, didn't say a fucking word and then tried to shake my hand. So I didn't shake his hand. I said, actually, come here for a minute. I want to talk to you. And fucking, we walked around the building. And I remember I was walking, like, great slow. And he was kind of, like, trailing behind, like, oh, fuck, are we going to fight? And we get around the building, and I say to him, the fuck, man, like, what the fuck's all this shit? Like, uh, everyone's telling me you're writing shit about me on the internet, and you're talking shit. But, like, if we, if we have some sort of beef, and I was being legit, because Tyson and me were friends, like, back in the day. Uh, or we at least got along, hung out a couple times, and uh, I was like, yeah, man, if, if there is something that I have maybe done and not realized I did, let me know, because, like, this is all right out of left field. And he goes, oh, no, man, uh, it's totally work. It's exactly what he said to me. And, and fuck you if you say different, Tyson, because he said it, it was totally a work. And, uh, and I'm like, well, fuck, man. You know, the exact thing that you would say to that we don't work together. We're not setting up a match. That makes no sense at all. But, you know, I'm thinking, okay, you want to use that excuse that it was a work because you don't want to say to my face, yeah, I'm pissed off, but whatever. So I let it go. And we went to a party at the Greaser's house. So the Greaser can vouch for this too. And I invited Tyson. Tyson didn't want to go. I got in Troy's ear. He got Tyson to go. So over the course of several adult beverages over the <laughs> night. This is probably about like 4 o'clock in the morning. So now, I remember sitting there as we were drinking and, and when we went out back and I said, what the fuck is all this shit? I almost wanted him to go, well, I'm pissed off because of this and I'm mad about that and rah, 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 And I almost wanted this confrontation that I didn't get. So then as I'm drinking, now now this thing that we have buried, you know, out back in the, uh, the Spryfield Lions Arena, I'm bringing back up in front of everyone and I'm like, Dude, I just don't understand why you fucking would say all that as a work and blah, 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 blah. And I said it flat out in front of everyone there that uh, maybe this is why he didn't write anything since. But I, I said right to him, right to his face that uh, I said, so if there is no issue, which is what he was saying, um, you know, for you to then go back and write anything new after in front of all these people to my face, you're saying there's no issue. And, you know, to be a coward and then write something that there is an issue after that, you'd be a huge fucking pussy. And uh, and that's where it ended. That's actually the last time I seen or talked to him. Back the happier times. Yeah, really. Uh, you me all worked out. I told you you're a shit disturber. Uh, you recently started working with the new promotion in Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. uh, you're yep. their champion now, correct? Yep. Yep. How did you get that booking and your thoughts on their shows over there? Oh man, there. That's another place that uh, that's doing really, really well and has uh, fucking so much potential to go even higher. Um, he has uh, some shows coming up April, uh, April 9th and 10th. Three shows in two days. So one of, it's a pretty ambitious uh, idea because he's going to go an afternoon show in one building and then an evening show in the same building. And he's been packing it, standing room only, every Both? single time. Both. Yeah, oh, wow. the, the two shows that he did so far uh, were standing room only That's where awesome. we had no chairs out back to sit in. That's awesome. um, and people lined up. Like sometimes, some, some areas... 
we have a standing room um, that was like two rows of standing room. So it's fucking crazy. Um, but very much on top potential. Um, and I think uh, what could help them is an influx of, you know, these maritime guys that have been going strong for a long time because, you know, they, they do have a, a, man, their crowd there is just, you know, they haven't been hot shotted. They're learning how to become a wrestling crowd the right way, uh, similar to like how it is over on PEI, where you know the fans aren't spoiled, so that when they do get something that's a really big high spot, they go crazy instead of seeing a million high spots that completely waters down what a high spot should be. Thoughts on them trusting you to be their champion um, after their first show? Um, I think um, because the, like the promoter over there knew a lot about my work. Um, and I think, uh, I think it was well-founded, uh, hopefully. Um, uh, I'd like to think, uh, like... I mean I, that in a positive way. Yeah, like they gave you the uh, belt on their first show. They obviously see yeah, something in you. Yeah. Your thoughts on... Well, that. I remember when, like, the first show, when I didn't even know anyone, they were like, yeah, we're going to put the belt on you. And I'm like, holy fuck, that's... Again, like, I probably felt the same way. Like, you don't even know me. Like, right. you just asked me to babysit your kids. we never <laughs> met before. Um, but, uh... But no, I, I, that night I went out and had two matches. Um, uh, I think both matches got over. Um, and then uh, I went back. I wrestled uh, Dynamite Dylan Davis, and I thought me and him tore the house down. Um, so now, I, I, like, I certainly feel in my groove there. Um, one of my, my things that I think could help them is, is them engaging the crowd more. And I don't know if anyone has seen me work heel before, but I like to engage the crowd and... Uh, and yeah, I think that that kind of, you know, helped my connection with the crowd, which then went, okay, well, he's, you know, perception is reality, he's got the belt, and he's the loud one, so yeah, let's, let's hope he falls on his face. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts on the current maritime wrestling scene? Um, you know what, I think, uh, and, and I might take some heat out of this, but I think a lot of fans are really fucking spoiled for how much they complain and, and how much they actually get. You know, if you want to go to a, a smaller show where maybe you don't care about, you know, the technical side of wrestling, but you want the theatric side, um, or if you want a show, you know, like that brings in a Mick Foley or a Kurt Angle, or if you want a family style show that's going to draw huge and be like an event, like there are so many, like, like if re local wrestling was uh, like ice cream right now, this would be Baskin Robbins. Like there's so many different flavors. Um, and I don't think the wrestling fans realize how good they have it because when I was a kid growing up, they had like Grand Prix and it would come through in the summer. And that's it. If you were on vacation when Grand Prix was here and you missed it, then you get to, you didn't get to see live wrestling again for another year. So, you know, for, you know, like the month of April, how many shows are going on in April? You probably know that better than me. There's, One, two, there's three this weekend alone. Um, and then there's four at the end of the month, so seven at least. And no one can say to me about, well, that's too oh, far. Oh, IHW probably has one, so that's eight. Uh, I think they have two. Two, so nine, month. and I don't <laughs> know what Bo Vision Pro probably does. Like, probably, yeah. yeah there's a bunch of new brackets. So probably, well, I'll say like <coughs> 13, 14 shows this month, something like that. Right? Come on, people. Yeah. Like, no one should be able to complain. Guess what? If you don't like that promotion or what they're doing, go check something else out. That's it. Like, it's really, you know, there's some places that do it better, obviously. Um, and, and uh, but like I said, I think uh, the magnitude of local wrestling, it's crazy right now how much we have here. Uh, your thoughts on the effort a pro wrestler needs to have in the gym, training wise, and effort in getting booked other places? It literally needs to be um, like at one time I looked at it almost like a full time job, and in, in many ways I still do. Um, because even when I'm not wrestling, I'm, I'm doing something work wise to get myself there, whether it's, you know, um, eating food that I don't like cause that I know that's better for me or making sure I get to the gym, um, making sure that I get my tans in, um, you know, uh, you try going to work at a, you know, a business type work place with this type of hairdo while you're snooty uh executive type people look at you going what the hell is this guy's problem <laughs> you know because of the you know four times a month that i might you know it makes sense but it doesn't make sense when you're at the grocery store and the little grannies are looking at you like you're some sort of crazy person it you need to commit to it um you need to uh, uh man like almost obsess over it like 
I can't watch a movie without putting it in wrestling terminology. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, Bruce Willis is the, you know, he's the main baby face, but, uh, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, the whole movie is broken down. Oh, well, he's getting beat up and he's under, getting heat, you know. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it needs to become something that, you know, and, and for me it was easy. I grew up watching wrestling, so it was always something I liked. So it was always playing in the background somewhere. Um, but, you know, to be successful in it, you need to take it off the back burner and put it, you know, put it more on the front burner a little bit. It doesn't mean you can't have any life whatsoever. Uh, you know, that's not true at all. But it needs to be a big part of your life. Your thoughts on the support the fans give you? Uh, well, I think just like all of us, without it, um, we're nothing. Without it, it's, you know, I forget the, who did the quote. It might have been Jericho, but it, it's the quote that's been around. Without it, we're just uh, a bunch of guys faking a fight in our underwear. That's <laughs> it. That's all it is. But, you know, with, with the, the crowd, you know, that's playing on people's emotions. That's, you know, bringing them into it, telling them a story that, you know, when you start rocking and rolling and they're, they're with it, they, they're getting the story. And, you know, it, it's weird. It's like, uh, it's like church almost in a way, you know, when you're out there because everyone's feeling the same emotion at the same time. And uh, without the fans, like I said, it, it's nothing. It means nothing. You can have the greatest match in the world and if there's two people there even if those two people are reacting it's not the same thing if you could put one match on a dvd of yours to show somebody what you do what match would you choose oh man i keep hearing you ask that question to other <laughs> people too and i'm like i don't know i like different matches for different reasons there's some matches that might not be the most technically sound but the, you know the crowd was there for it or there, or there might be, uh, you know, matches that were more technically sound and, and we hit everything crisp, but the crowd wasn't there for it. Um, if I had one, shit, I haven't even seen it, but I remember it and I would, it's probably for more Marco reasons for me because I wasn't a big TNA fan, but I knew who Christopher Daniels and AJ Styles were. Um, so I'll say my match with Daniels, um, I trained really, really hard for it. I was really, really prepared going into it because I knew this guy was definitely going to be prepared for it. The night before, I actually broke my nose. I think you wrecked I that, that match. match yeah. with Jeremy and, uh, uh, yeah. and uh, Profit. So I come up the next night, and uh, I think we locked up. Started first, bleeding instantly. Our I first collar elbow. Yeah. He punched me in the nose, but my nose at that point was freshly broken, so like he yeah. tapped it, and it, it would have juiced. And uh, so thank God I did the, all the crazy cardio I did going into it because I wrestled that whole match only being able to breathe out of my mouth. And I think we did like 22 minutes yeah. or some shit. Like it was hard hitting, um, the finish pop. Uh, yeah, it was. Um, who do you think is the best wrestler in the Maritimes right now? Um, I know, but I don't want to say because uh, because I'll never hear him shut up about it. Um, I would say uh, I would say probably Suave. Yeah. Yeah. I think if uh, I think if anyone out of this area in our generation of guys is going to go anywhere further with it, like you know, I, I would say Suave for sure. Marcus Beek. Is there anything we haven't touched on or talked about that you want to mention? Fuck no, man. You brought up <laughs> shit that I didn't even remember. Old wounds. Uh, what does the future hold for you? Um, I am... Dude, I'm going to go strong uh, as long as I possibly can. Um, I respect this business and, you know, if I ever get to a point where I'm not able to do it the way that I know I could do it or, you know, I get too old or something like that, um, I'll, you know, I'll stop, but I don't plan on stopping anytime soon. I plan on going stronger and harder. and So, yeah, man, I'm not going anywhere. If the WWE Performance Center was around when you started wrestling, is that something you would have chosen to go to? If I, Well, you know what? And I said it earlier. If I looked, if me now, knowing what I know now, uh, looked at the 18-year-old 18 18 version of myself, um, I, I would probably see zero value in so what I, if I had more of a mentor, I think, when I started, that would kind of steer me in the door the right way. And I think it's very important now, too, that these guys that are trying to break in, you know, like, have yourself prepared so that when you break in, it's not like, oh, now I have to figure out how to work out and be an athlete. You should have kind of that shit, you know, under your belt before you start. 
Um, but yeah, if I had more guidance and I was 18 years old and, and didn't have kids and responsibility, then yeah, that I definitely would have, I think, yeah. IHW is coming to Truro in May. Your thoughts on IHW coming to your hometown? I think it's awesome. I really do. Um, I, uh, you know, Truro, uh, I said it earlier too, I think is on tap. I think it has a lot of potential, um, and if that town is nursed correctly, I think it can draw really well. Um, I think it is going to be neat that, uh, you know, very rarely do I wrestle in my hometown. I go to a lot, like, places like Moncton that I'm there all the time, and, and even Halifax have started to feel more like my hometown because of the places where, I've, where I wrestle. Um, but to go back now... Um, and wrestle in front of like my family and old teachers and people I know and stuff like that. It's going to be really cool. Um, and uh, me and Riddick, who is also from Truro, in the main event fighting for the belt. So how cool is that? You know, not only to come back, but to come back kind of distinguished a little bit. <laughs> uh, do you have any closing comments to any friends, family, or fans that may be watching this? Um, I just thank you for the support. Um, you know, I'm going to keep doing, you know, what I'm doing. I'm going to keep working hard. Um, you know, and like I said, without the fans, um, you know, and the promoters that put on the show and, you know, there's so many people behind the scenes that don't get credit. And, and you know, the wrestling crew isn't just the boys in the back and, and the promoter or booker. You know, we got referees, we got camera guys. We have guys that do the social media, uh, you know, Dave Boyce is a huge person, Harold, you're a huge person in that, you know, that to help kind of spread, you know, you know, because like I said, it's sometimes hard, especially, you know, when you're doing all this prep to go into a match, that's what you're focused on. So then to have someone to come back and go, well, I made this really cool video package and you're like, wow, that's awesome. And that helps get, you know, the word out and awareness and stuff like that out. So. You know, props to all of, uh, you know, the supporting cast that doesn't get enough credit and uh, the fans, of course. Uh, one final question. It's come up a lot lately. Your thoughts on how open professional wrestling is now in social media. You have wrestlers arguing with wrestlers, arguing with fans, arguing with promoters. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, like I said, um, even if somebody in a, the person, a personal aspect of my life, someone that didn't like me or a wrestling fan that didn't like me or a wrestler that didn't like me, if they started writing a bunch of shit, I'm not going to write back just because that, you know, you look, now you look as stupid as they do. You know what I mean? That's where the whole eats popcorn memes and all that shit comes from. But if you throw wrestling on top of it, it's supposed to be professional wrestling. Um, it makes it look very, uh, like... I just, it turns my stomach when I see two, whether it's a work or not, you know, like you said, it could be just two wrestlers that don't like each other or two wrestlers that are trying to get a storyline over, make a video and don't make a video with your toilet in the background or a half open <laughs> door or some shit like that. Make a video and make it look like a wrestling video. And if you're a true professional and someone made a, you know, a, a little disc video to me, guess what? If I, if I want to get my shots back, I'll make a, an even more professional, even funnier video or even sharper video to get back at you. You know why? Because that looks professional. All right. Well, I'd like to thank you very much for taking your time out to do this interview. Uh, I think it was really good. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks, buddy.